coming soon from Warner Brothers Pictures. When you're in trouble, when there's nowhere to turn, you can always call on the nice guys. Starring Russell Crowe, Ryan Gosling, and introducing Jim Basinger as Judith Kuttner. Before we go solving the crime of the century, let's deal with the rotting corpse. I've got a plan. Run. Trouble has a way of finding them. And that's just how they like it. Ow! The Nice Guys. Coming to a multiplex near you. Now I know you guys are all really excited for this group of men right here, but you should know that we have a legend on the stage with us right now. Joel Silver has produced all of your favorite action movies ever made, including The Nice Guys, too. Really? And Shane, you and Joel have worked together for a very long time. You've done a number of movies together. What keeps the two of you coming back to each other? I think that we, we share a common sensibility. We kind of like the same sorts of movies. And Joel does this type of tough guy picture better than anybody else in the world. Well, I as mean, do you. With Joel. <laughs> Whenever I wander away from Joel, the, yeah. But we, we have a lot of fun together, and I think that this one is the best one that we've done yet. Absolutely. Uh, I heard that you, know, you wrote the script a long time ago, and Ryan, you, you read the script on your own and sort of got in touch and were like, let's try to make this movie, and Russell, you got involved as well at the same time. What sort of turned you on to this movie? Maybe I have the timeline wrong? Yeah, that's, you, all, all of that information you just put together is all bullshit, so. I will never read anything on the internet again, my fault. <laughs> wow, that, that's a big thing. <laughs> there it's goes done. that job. The internet's done for me, guys, it's, except for this show. Um, so how did you guys get involved in the movie? What moved you about the script? The a sort of detective story set in the 70s, uh, uh, you know, a studio action picture that doesn't have a comic book behind it or doesn't have any sort of pre-awareness. It's a big gamble, and it's a really hilarious script. What brought you to it? What made you want to play a detective? Well, exactly what you just said then, man. It's a, it was a really hilarious script, and not only the fact that it was hilarious, it was dense. It was a dense narrative. There's a lot going on in the story, and there's a lot going on with the characterizations. So it's not what I would assume or have experienced before when somebody hands me a script and says, this is a comedy. This was a complete world, and it was a world built with characters that you can believe in. It just happens to be an absurd situation, which is where the comedy comes from. You know? Ryan, uh, your character is kind of dim, kind of slow. Maybe. Wow, so offensive, eh? First, he's never going to read anything on the internet again, and now he's slagging off Ryan. No. I'm a dense script and a dim character. Yeah. <laughs> All right. uh, were you interested in doing something like this after having directed Lost River, which I imagine was a huge undertaking for yourself? <laughs> Set that one up for you. Uh, <laughs> I planted them for you. It's, it's yeah. good. Uh, what attracted you to, this, to, to doing a character like this, doing a sort of a, a big comedy in an action, in an action picture? Well, it's all the things that you said first, and then on top of that, you add, there's a giant smoking bee, there's, we're chasing mermaids, there's tree people, it's Joel, it's Shane, it's Matt, it's Russell. I mean, there were so, there were so many reasons, you know? Plus this kind of film, I mean, I grew up on, on, on their movies, you know? And so it's like a, cooked into my, uh, you know, whatever, cinematic DNA. So You're a big Lethal Weapon fan? Lethal Weapon, but even, uh, he hates it when I say it, but Monster Squad, you know, it was the first movie I ever really was <laughs> quoting, you know, Wolfman's Got Nards. I mean, everyone, everyone remembers that. It's a, it's a haunting line. Have people Monster Squad? Is this audience <laughs> yes. Monster Squad? Yeah. Within the past month with my kids. <laughs> I'd have hold up for you, Matt. Great. Beautifully. So to get a chance to, to work with them and to work with, 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 with these guys was, you know, there was, it was, there was no reason to say no. Shane, I think Russell brings up something really great about the movie, which is that it is so densely plotted, like a classic noir. We've sort of forgotten over a number of years that noir was 
a very dense plot. You look at the Maltese Falcon or something, it's always ahead of you, and then at the end, you're just sort of coming around to understanding everything that has happened. As a screenwriter, when you're making a, a movie for a very large audience at this point, do you ever have doubt that they're going to be able to pick everything up that you're putting down for them? I, I think you, the danger, if anything, is in over-explaining. I mean, the, the, the worst thing in movies is where they stop the plot and then someone says, you know, just tells you what you already saw. Or the worst for me is loop lines, where on your back of someone's head and you just hear, that's the guy we saw on the train, you know, <laughs> because they're so afraid that no one's going to get it. So I think audiences are a lot brighter than we give them credit. And I think that um, detective story that just feels like it's moving is more important than sort of spelling everything out, especially when you've got great character beats going on in the meantime. Yeah, absolutely. The two of you are hilarious together. Had you always wanted to work together? How did you develop this relationship on set? Well, I was talking to Ryan's mum the other day, and she said <laughs> it was one of the first things that he said when he was, uh, just after he was born, you know, coming up like two, two years old. He said, Mom, I want to work with Russell Crowe. And she said, well, one day, baby. At, at two years old, what was your Russell Crowe movie that you were, you were a big fan of at that point? Rumpa Stumpa. Yeah, was yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was actually Russell's work in The, the Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants. Mm. <laughs> yes. That really made me think, I, I, have to, I have to know that man. I was more interested in the two-year-old baby gosling that liked Romper Stomper, to be honest with you. you that's weird, man. You got to <laughs> same look haircut. at that, pal. <laughs> Matt, this is a, a completely different kind of character that we've seen you play. Uh, I don't want to give too much away, because it's an awesome reveal yeah. when, you come, when you come into the picture. It's completely unexpected that that's who you're going to be. Can you talk about getting asked to do this part, and maybe you can give it away? I don't, I don't want to feel be any pressure with the way you guys are looking at me right now. Uh, look, I was so lucky to be along for the ride on this one. It was so much fun, and you know, anytime you get a chance to play a cold-blooded, borderline robotic assassin who comes in the visage of John Boy from the Waltons, that's already an inherently funny dichotomy to me. So, um, that's funny, right? I think it's funny. Whatever. So, um, yeah. I, I think we got a lot of Waltons awareness out yeah, there. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, demographics. Uh, but, yeah, it was, it was an incredible time. And I learned so much from watching these guys and getting to work with two of, of, of the great, iconic uh, creators of my childhood formative years watching cinema. So it was incredible. Joel, what's it like to hear these guys say that you were such a part of their formative years, that you, that you are essentially in many ways a legend? It's bullshit. <laughs> uh, we, it, it's interesting. Shane and I have been together for 30 years. I mean, really, 30 years. We met in 1986. He had just come out of UCLA. He was 21 years old. Starting with Predator? Like no, doing no, a little work on Predator? It was Lethal Predator? Weapon 1. Oh, Lethal Weapon. Lethal Weapon Run 1. And then uh, to get him to work uh, potentially as a writer on Predator, we hired him to be an actor in Predator, where he was skinned alive early in the picture. And, uh, but he didn't really want to, he just wrote some jokes for himself. He didn't really want to write any of the script. But then we did Lethal Weapon 2 in 89, and then we did Last Boy Scout in 91. Then he took a period of introspection, and then I didn't get back with him until 2005 when we did Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. Yeah. Um, and that, of course, you know, besides Downey being on his ass, Downey then came out of that and asked Shane to work with him where he did Lethal, uh, Iron Man 3, and then he could do whatever he wanted. But, but this script was actually written before. Yeah, no laws applied to me after that. I could do anything <laughs> I wanted. He did this, he wrote the, wrote the script before he, we did Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, and it kind of sat around for a while. And then after, we tried to make a television series, we tried to do it as a yeah. few different things. And then after Iron Man 3, when they said, what do you want to do now? He said, I really want to do, I want to do Nice Guys. And I wanted to go back to the well, not just at Private Eye Films, which you see far too few of these days, but also a chance again to work with Joel. He's just sort of been the... Uh, you know, I, I would say the devil you know, except he's an angel. He, he gets it, and he knows how to do this shit. But, but, in, the, but in the magic of, of, of show business, which really the process does work, Shane's agency also represents Russell. And when the word came out that he might want to do a new version of Nice Guys, we got called by his very talented young agent, George Freeman, who said, what about Russell for that? And I said, Russell Crowe? And he goes, yeah. I said, what do you want to do like a... A, a comedy like that? So, you know, Russell's very funny. I said, yeah, right. He said, no, he, he is really very funny. So, so we, Russell spoke with Shane. Shane was literally on his way to see him in Australia when I had always courted Ryan's 
people, because I, I love, I wanted to work with him. I said, do you think that Ryan would want to do a movie <laughs> like this with Russell? Hey, Ryan loves Russell. So by the time Shane arrived in Australia to meet with Russell, who was like eh, questioning whether he wanted to do a movie like this or whatever, I don't know. And then he sat there and said, what about with Ryan Gosling and you? He said, I'm in. 72 hours, had a movie like that. Perfect. That is the corrected timeline that's, that's from the, the one timeline. that I screwed up. Thank that's you, Joel. <laughs> and uh, there was Ryan... a whole bunch of made up stuff in that as well. But we just, we'll just leave it the way it was. It's good. It's a you good story. You shouldn't read the internet either then. Well, Ryan, but maybe they can read it now. What was it like to be courted by Joel? <laughs> <laughs> it actually, the first time I went, I was summoned to Joel's house. <laughs> I, I got there and I, it looked like it landed. His house looks like it landed on a hill, you know? It's, it's like, a, like a spaceship, and there's no way of knowing where the front door is except that the, somehow the grounds just take you into the, into, the, into, the front, into the opening where there's a giant reflecting pool the size of this room. And there was, his son was playing with a motorboat in the, in the reflection pool. And, I, and then Joel walks up to me and he calls over his son and he goes, come here for a second, come here for a second. And he says uh, to his kid, um, do you know who this is? <laughs> and his son goes, no. <laughs> and Joel says, all right, go to your room. <laughs> and then when his son goes upstairs, he looks at me and he goes, he goes, uh, I did the same thing with Downey two years ago. <laughs> and you know what my kid's going upstairs to do right now? He's going to play with one of Downey's action figures. <laughs> Let me tell you something. You want my kid to know who you are. <laughs> These are my Picassos. <laughs> and it goes on from there. But that's, that's a taste of what it's like to be courted by Joel. Um, Shane, this movie, uh, this story, because it was a TV show that you were working on, it didn't initially take place in the 70s. But now that it, it, it does, I, don't, I couldn't imagine it taking place in any other era. You do such a great job of not just being sort of kitschy about the 70s, but you really have plot strands that are about yeah. that, that time. Can you talk about developing that? Yeah, I thought it was important that we not be in your face in a way that's just about the fashion, which, by the way, I do have to say, these guys rock the clothes. We got the cool version of the 70s. If you see this, you know, they should just dress like that all the goddamn time. <laughs> but <clears throat> really, the 70s in LA was, a, was an odd time. It was still the sort of end game destination for every American dreamer was to come out to the coast but the Hollywood sign was broken, falling off the hill. You had a crust of smog over the city. There were actual sirens, like air raid type sirens that would tell kids to go inside because the smog was so bad. And Hollywood Boulevard was a porn pit. Every other storefront was triple X. Not Vin Diesel, but like XXX, you know. <laughs> and um, I mean, it was just the setting, this compromised sort of latter-day Sodom and Gomorrah, which is perfect for these two sort of tarnished angels you know, trying to fill the shoes of an iconic private eye that they could never possibly fit. <laughs> uh, Russell, had you been wanting to do comedy for a long time? He said that your, your agents had said that you're really funny and that you wanted to do comedy, but he didn't even think that you would be interested in that. There's just no way in the world that my agent made that phone call. <laughs> 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 Whatever. Uh, and my agent, my young agent, who's <laughs> young? a number of years older than me. Um, <laughs> um, anyway. Uh, cyclically, if you look back through the 50 or so films I've, I've done, you'll see comedies come around every now and then, but probably in the same kind of uh, cycle that other types of, well, other genres of film comes around as well, you know. I'm not afraid of it, uh, comedy at all, but, you know, I have a particular type of sense of humour. So you can't tell me something's funny. If I find it funny, then that'll be a comedy. But, you know, if I read something and you're telling me it's a comedy and I don't find it funny, then I'm just not going to be doing your movie, you know? <laughs> so. so it's not really about the genre of comedy, it's just sort of whether or not you like it. Every single decision I've ever made about a movie starts with the narrative. You know, I, I believe my responsibility as an actor is to be part of a group of people who are telling a story. Simple as that, you know? And at the end of the day, my acting is job is the same as me sitting down in the bar and telling you a story and telling you a joke. It's the same thing. It's just an extension of that, you know? So if I don't believe in the story I'm about to tell, it's really hard for me to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning and put makeup on and run around and be a bit of an idiot, you know what I mean? So I only do it if I believe in it, and it comes from what the narrative is to start with. And it was a damn good story, you know, bottom yeah. line. 
Absolutely. And you're, you're in many ways kind of the straight man to Ryan's sort of... Uh, Gay man. <laughs> uh, I know it was cheap, but I've got to get them. They've got to get the cheap ones in as well. You want to you pick that one up, Ryan? No, no, no I want to leave that right there. But you, you... For everyone to see, I want to leave it right there. You get, to, you, you, you get to be kind of like really uh, somewhat over-the-top silly one who's sort of walking into... I know, I fucking... I'm sorry, man. <laughs> you're dim, you're dim, you're over-the-top, you're silly. No, no, he's a schmuck. Honestly, I heard the word schmuck more in this movie than I've ever heard it. They stopped saying cut at a certain point. I just hear with Joel behind the monitor going, what a schmuck. <laughs> was that exciting for you to jump into that role? Can you talk about sort of becoming a schmuck? It was very easy. It took about 10 minutes. <laughs> There's some there's I just some, took a good look in the mirror and I went, I got this. There's some, there's some great choices that you make. I mean, I think it's in one of the trailers when Russell's bending your arm back and the way that you're screaming no is such a silly way to scream no in that moment. That's how I scream, actually. A, <laughs> I see a spider and that's what happens, but I decided in this, uh, that scream. Oh, okay. But I thought, uh, you know, maybe I could make lemonade out of those lemons, you know? Make a little scratch off of that. Who's, <laughs> who's lemons? <laughs> Well, the scream is the lemon, you know. Oh, what I mean? okay. You don't you don't want that as a grown man. <laughs> Joel, uh, you have produced. I mean, I know that the two of you love working together. You've produced so many incredible movies over the years. What keeps you going? What keeps you wanting to tell stories? This, just sitting here with you guys talking about the movie. I mean, look, we we, we do this these very complicated kind of uh, life choices. We find material. We find people that want to put them you know put them together. Actors do, and then we make these movies, and we just hope people like them. Who people want to see him, and and if they do want to see him and they enjoy him, that's what it's all about, you know. And and I think this movie really is fun. It really works, and and you see, you know, these guys and the girls that are with us in the in the movie and the, all the characters. It's really it, he has a very singular voice. Shane's got a very singular voice, and I think it resonates. And I think that you know this is really not a comedy per se. It's a thriller. It's a mystery, but it's very funny. And and just to, to have that idea and have it, you know come to a completion and, and for us to talk about it like this is just really makes, makes me feel good. Absolutely, and I think it's, a, it's not just a crowd pleaser for someone who loves movies and loves the detective genre. It really fits right into that and explores that and plays with it. So you get to sort of view it through the lens of people who like noir films. Uh, so it'll please a big crowd, but I think it'll also please a lot of film buffs. It's really great to watch it like that. Uh, Shane, you have such an incredible voice when it comes to that genre. Can you talk about developing that? Yeah, you, you, you can't develop something you don't already just uh, sort of naturally have brewing. And uh, from a very early age, for whatever reason, I, I gravitated to the top shelf of my father's bookcase, which had all the private eye novels. And I weren't allowed to read them because, you know, they, they were the sex parts. They were the part they described in the pulp world as what? Creamy half moons, <laughs> were they, which I guess meant breasts. Um, I didn't um, even know. It just sounded dirty. I know. That's the same thing to me, too. I didn't know what I was reading, but it just I, it excited me nonetheless. Um, and, then you, and then you said breasts, and I'm still like, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It could easily be him. Um, but the, the books struck me from an early age as conveying a sense of melancholy and bittersweetness, but at the same time, they could be so exciting. And the cowboy and the western, by the way, are the two literary genres which are completely native and, and specific to America. They were invented here, and the same writers in the day who would do a pulp western would then switch around, alternate with a detective novel. And it's that kind of frontier cowboy sort of justice and mystery solving that brought me back again and again to this stuff. And I think we had a legacy to, to fulfill. We had a torch to carry before we just did a comedy to really make sure it was also in the profound and you know, long-standing tradition of these kinds of privatized stories. And I think that's what's so great about it, is you're not just doing a mystery or an action comedy. You, are, you do care about carrying that torch. So often we see action comedies that don't care about carrying that torch at all, and it's really a testament to the film that you do that. Thank you. Yeah. Matt, I, uh, I, had a, oh, yeah. I had a meeting at Shane's house one day, and uh, he, was, I, he, was, he was a little late, and so I was just wandering around his house. <laughs> and uh, it's like, it was like the library in The NeverEnding Story. It's just a museum <laughs> to noir, and... You realize that he's such he's 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 could give a master class on, on 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 the genre, and he finds a way to synthesize all of it into his own voice, and at the same time constantly find a way to 
to subvert all the cliches. So it's what makes it so you're getting all the best parts of it, but at the same time, he's, he's making it completely fresh every time. You know, even when we were working with him, I remember we were doing a scene, which is, you know, it's, 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 it's the classic Butch and Sundance scene where two guys are shooting out the window and, and, and I'm supposed to toss Russell the gun and Shane goes, you know, they always catch the gun in movies. What if it just goes out the window, you know? And then we, Russell and I have to figure out how to do this shootout with one gun, you know, and it ends with me just handing him bullets out of a cookie jar, you know? And of course, <laughs> that's the most interesting way to play that scene. You've seen it so many times, but he always has the audience's back in that way too, you know? You never have those moments in his movies where you go, oh God, this again, you know? He's always, he's always got you in that way too, so it, it's... Uh, it's uh, There's also the scene at the, right at the top of the movie without, again, giving anything away where you punch the window, which for my money is worth the price of admission for 10 movies. That scene is so funny <laughs> and so unexpected. I, I laughed hysterically when that happened. Uh, Matt, have, have you done a lot of action movies before? I, I don't think I've seen you really this, this good with a gun before. Uh, no, well, thank you. Uh, no, I, I, I'd done limited stuff here and there, but they were so great about giving me all kinds of weapons training and, and, and you know, letting me have all my neurotic extra time that I wanted to learn how to pop and lock the clips. And, um, what is pop and lock? I know pop and lock, call, but what does pop and lock a clip mean? You know, pop the clip out of the AK-47 and lock the next one in. Pretty badass, man. Um, but well, the, no, there, yeah. it was so fun with these guys. I, there was a scene where I, I think I fired four different weapons at you guys all in the same take. And... You know, you played cops and robbers growing up as a kid, and then all of a sudden you're doing it with Ryan Gosling and Russell Crowe. It's pretty surreal. I have to say, Matt really put the work in with the weapons. He really is so slick with them. And that slickness with the weapons gives him the real threat that his character brings in the movie. He did great work with that stuff. That's and he comes in halfway through the movie. He also came in halfway through the shoot. You know, and we just kept hearing, like, where's Matt? And he's like, he's, he's, a, he's at the gun range. There was, he was yeah, there was... There. <laughs> well, there was, he, there was at the gun range... Is that the strip club? Is it the gun range? Right, well, was, well that's, but, you know, that's, that's up to Matt. To... I've been working at the strip club. And then he comes, and then, <clears throat> but it's such a, it's a hell of an entrance that he made on set, and that he also, because he come, his first scene is where he's firing, you know, it's just like a, it's just like a, 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 a he, he fires four different kinds of guns at us, and over the course of one take, it's a hell of an entrance. The, only to be matched maybe by Joel's entrance in Who Framed Roger Rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> They're on I, par. I have to say, we have most of the cast on the stage, but we are missing one person, uh, the little girl that plays your daughter, yeah. who was so phenomenal in the film. Can you talk about working with her? Um, I think a strong case could be made that she's actually in her late 30s. I know she says <laughs> <laughs> she was definitely the most mature person on set. Um, <laughs> Just, Similar to her character, then. Yeah. She really is. It, 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 she's incredible. You know, she, uh, she, she, she knew exactly what her character would and wouldn't do. She had no problem fighting for that, stating that. You know, she really brought um, such a, a strong sense of the scene to the, to, 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 the, to the scene. And it helped us all kind of, I mean, for me, not knowing how that dynamic was going to work. You know, there's a lot, of, there's a lot to that relationship. Um, it, she just handed it to me in the audition. She walked in, and just by the nature of who she is and how she is, I, I knew exactly how how it was going to work. And I'm sure she'll, you know, she'll will be work. Well, I'll be working for her one day. Yeah, she's incredible. I'm going to turn it over to the audience for questions in just a second. But Shane, I, have, I mean, you you have a house filled with noir. After people watch The Nice Guys, what's one movie that you think that they should go watch that The Nice Guys is influenced by, or you just think is the great noir film that people should see? Well, that's a good one. <clears throat> you know, uh, well, if they like the movie, they might go back and see a picture Joel and I did called Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, which I think yeah. uh, spiritual cousin. Uh, if you do go see films that we didn't do, and I don't advise it. I was talking way, way back, so yeah, there was no Yeah, I would say uh, go see, the, the, there's a, the 70s, the original Dirty Harry, movies like Clute with Donald Sutherland, Night Moves with Gene Hackman. I mean, these are really powerful stories that happen to take place within the detective genre. Um, or, uh, Harper with Paul Newman is a good one, too. Mm. So, there you go. Um, <laughs> I would definitely say that if you like this kind of tough guy stuff, and you, but you want to get beyond just sort of the super cape flying around of it that's been sort of pre prevailing in the marketplace, go, go dig up some real good old-fashioned private eye fiction. If you want, just call me, I'll tell you. <laughs> All right, let's turn it over to the audience for questions. First question. Hi, guys. Thanks for being here. Um, so my first question is for everyone. Um, what is the secret uh, to a good buddy duo? 
And my second question is for Joel and Shane. Would you guys ever consider doing a chick buddy duo in the future? What? I think you do, haven't you? You must have done one by now. Yeah, yeah. We, but the point is, it probably wasn't very good, and that's why she doesn't remember it. Um, we can do. Well, I'd love to do a good one, female centric. I mean, I, you know, I, I think we all have different sides inside us. If you can write a character, then that's you. So I've written women. I'm probably part woman, and I'd love to do a complete, you know, exploration of that part. And Joel, I'm sure, will join me in that. So Joel is going to join you looking for your girly bits. Kind of pretty great buddy duo yourself over here, <laughs> and we it's solved true. crimes. Yeah. We were uh, the whole time we were shooting. Russell and I would just look at the two of them and go, "This is really the movie." You know, I wish <laughs> no matter what we were doing, there was always something more entertaining going on. Uh, you know, behind the monitor. But honestly, I think the the for me, it's just to have these these two guys uh, man the helm. That's the tr that's the key to to making a great buddy film. I mean, they've I think they've really cracked cracked the code and and. Um, I, I, I was, I'm thrilled that I, I've never made one, and I, and I wouldn't want to do one with uh, anyone else. Do you have a code for the buddy film, Shane? Not so much. It's just it's different every time. I think that the fun of it is, you know, books I read when I was a kid, like The Cricket in Times Square, Charlotte's Web, oddly, those all have these wonderful, heartfelt friendships in them that end up sort of bittersweetly, and I think that's kind of the, been the basis for this in, a, in an odd way. Uh, I think it's all about a soulful, kind of heartfelt and organic relationship that's funny, but first and foremost has real actors with real chops giving you a, a honest performance, honest friendship. Uh, it's more cathartic that way. Next question. Hi, guys. Thanks for coming in. I have a question for all of you. Today is Monster Health Day. It's AOL's Corporate Volunteer Day. What are the causes that you each care most about? Getting people to see the nice guys. No. <laughs> I'm actually a big animal, uh, the, the, the Humane Farming Association, and just w ways to prevent animals from being starved and ke kept without water for days while they're being transported and humanely killed as opposed to uh, having their skin stripped from them while they, they're still kind of living. Um, the, the Hunan Festival, the sort of trying to lobby against this dog-eating festival and this torture of animals, which is traditional in many religions. I'm a bull about that. I love animals. Um, I think EJI is an incredible organization um, headed by Brian Stevenson. The work that they're doing with people who are uh, wrongfully imprisoned is, is really remarkable. And I also think uh, the Century, which is... Uh, um, John Prendergast and George Clooney's new project, where they're doing uh, they're doing some really amazing work. It's worth worth checking out. I run a football club in Australia called the <laughs> South Sydney Rabbitohs, and as part of the development of reconnecting the club with its community, we established a thing called South Cares, and South Cares. Basically, from primary school age all the way through to all the kids in our district, we have a direct connection with them. And through making that happen, we've actually seen in the entire district the level of truancy just go down because the kids anticipate these football players coming to the school and they don't want to not be there on the day that they arrive, you know. And by extension, from that community work, we've also gone into a whole bunch of different indigenous issues in Australia dental health and, and other things, you know, um, where there's, you know, an obvious need for more focus. But the other thing that I like to do is plant trees. 37,000 so far. And I advise you, recommend to you, if you have the opportunity, plant a tree. <laughs> Feels great. Uh, for me, for me, it's anything related to kids and and their upbringing and development and making sure they have proper education and uh, health uh, benefits and and you know they're. Th thank you for the amen. Thank you. Someone's I'm trying to preach a gospel up here, baby. Thank you. 
But uh, I, I work with a happy customer. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I've worked with Art of Elysium for a long time. I started volunteering with them at hospitals maybe, you know, 15 years ago or something. And thank you. <laughs> and uh, so them, Glisten, any, anything that's about freedom and equality for kids, I'm, I'm all about. That baby was actually just a big white collar fan. Sorry, Matt. <laughs> Sweet. Next question. Hey, Joel, what advice would you give to a young producer or someone looking to produce films? This would be good. <laughs> Everybody, this is going to be great. Relax. Watch this. Here he goes. Look, I mean, we're at a time now where, you know, you can make a movie at your kitchen table, you know, and it can go out on AOL, go out on YouTube. I mean, you know, when we started, I mean, you had to go hat in hand to anyone to try to get something to happen, but it's, it's just you have to be passionate about an idea and try to get it done, try to get, get a group of friends together to help you do it, and just, you know, it, it, there's, so many, there's so many forums, there's so many avenues for people to see what you do. It's a great time, and I think that, you know, it's, it's a self-starting kind of uh, occupation. You gotta find a way, you gotta, it's, it's Sisyphus, you're pushing that boulder up a hill every day, and, but I think it's, it's a possibility now that a, a, anybody who's passionate and has a dream and, a, and has a desire and a creative, you can get there. And, uh, and people can see your work and can benefit, can, can benefit, everybody can benefit from it. So just go out and do it. You didn't mention the swearing. Oh. <laughs> swearing? Fuck all you guys. <laughs> all right, hold on. We'll do a, should we do a Joel story from the set? <laughs> Please. Physics? So we're, we're on the set, standing there, and there was this television crew that wanted to come and do an interview on the set. And Ryan didn't necessarily want them to come there because he thought they'd been disrespectful or something, you know, in a previous... No, you just hated them? You, they, they just sucked? Yeah, I just didn't like the look of them. Yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> That's okay then. So Joel is kind of trying to use me to convince him. So he comes up to the two of us who are standing there and he goes, Russell, come on, you got to help me. We got to talk to the kid. And I, and I said, hey, whatever Ryan wants to do. No, 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 guys, guys, you got to listen to me. All right. It's about eyeballs, okay? We get the camera crew down here. They shoot the story. The story goes on television, eyeballs. <laughs> then they talk about it on the internet, eyeballs. We got eyeballs here, eyeballs there. We got eyeballs, as many eyeballs, millions of eyeballs. Eyeballs, it's just fucking physics. <laughs> but however, as we arrived here today, and I was talking to the lovely producer who's of your show, where is she, where is she? Right there, she's right here. What is the word you use today to this group when we sat down? What did you say? Eyeballs. Thank you. Hey! To which the two of you in the back of the room said, it's physics, and started laughing. I had no idea what you were talking about. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. How's it going, guys? So I know that Ryan and Russell, both of you have dabbled in directing. Uh, would you guys like to direct more? And Matt, would you ever like to explore directing at all? I didn't fucking dabble, son. <laughs> you owned it. <laughs> that was pretty solid. Over to you, Matt. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, I would love to someday, yeah, at the right time when I feel like I have the right people around me and, and the right uh, level of knowledge that I would feel to even attempt that, then absolutely. Yeah, I'd like, I'd like to try it again. <laughs> Dabble or try, Ryan? Where, where, where do you land? Well, whatever I have the money for. <laughs> uh, guys, when does the movie come out? When can people see the nice May guys? May 20th. May 20th in theaters. It's amazing. It's so funny. It's so good. It's something that you're not going to see in the theater for a very long time. Thank you so much for being here, you guys. It's been an honor to have you. Thank you. Thank you for being here, you guys. Thank you.